welcome back to the Colin Cadmus podcast. Today, I'm joined by Anthony Natoli. Anthony graduated from the University of Arizona in 2015 and then jumped straight into sales as a BDR for Ethos Lending, followed by a promotion to his first AE role where he earned his way into President's Club not once, but twice in a row. After Ethos Lending, Anthony moved on to crushing quota at Demandbase, Outreach, and Lattice, followed by a seven-month stint as head of sales development for QA Wolf until starting his most recent and current role as senior account executive at LinkedIn. After 10 years of selling for top B2B SaaS companies, including a taste of SDR leadership, I'm excited to dive in and find out firsthand from a top frontline salesperson what's actually working today and what isn't. Before we get started, if you're watching on YouTube, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and leave us a comment if you have questions. If you're joining us from Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please drop us a review and let us know what you think of the episode. This stuff really helps to grow the audience. Without further ado, let's dive in and find out what Anthony has learned over the past decade, and more specifically, what's working today at LinkedIn and what isn't. Anthony, thanks for joining me and welcome to the show. What's up, Colin? Pumped to be here. Excited to dive into to everything today. Likewise, I think you might be the first person I'm having on the show who I know from the internet, but I actually didn't find you on LinkedIn. I think I discovered you on Twitter. Yeah. Did you I did you start posting on LinkedIn first and then eventually Twitter or was it the other way around? Yeah, like anything, I wanted to let it fly more and post things that aren't so buttoned up. And so Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, was a great way That's for right. me to just brain dump and uh, share more personal things. And I think we got connected randomly and I definitely think that was our first interaction. Um, I had been following you before I started even posting on LinkedIn. So that was a cool full circle moment for me. And now being able to share the time with you on the podcast is is fun. Yeah, yeah. I think you actually, I think finding you there, it sort of tapped me into this like group of salespeople that are on X. I keep calling it Twitter still, but I had never really posted there. I would like reshare some stuff if someone posted about me or whatnot, but now I'm starting to put some stuff out there. I started by just repeating what I'm putting on LinkedIn, but I, I think I'll probably start, you know, tweeting or what do we call it? Xing? I don't even know what we call it anymore now, but yeah. So, so thanks for that. You, you inspired me to, to get active there and unlocked me into this, this world of sort of what feels like it's like inked LinkedIn, like X rated, not X rated, but like, like LinkedIn, like unscripted, so to speak. Right. Like that's, that's kind of what it feels like on, on X now with the sales group. But anyhow, let's dive in. I have, let's see, nine questions. We might not get through them all. And some of them are similar to what I've been asking other folks this season. I've had sort of a theme of a lot of these questions, but also I have some unique questions for you. And the one I want to start with first is a really a big question. And I have no idea how you're going to answer this. I could probably guess, but I really am curious after going through your resume and seeing like, you know, you worked your way up into this SDR leadership role. And it looks like you kind of decided to back out of it relatively quickly. You spent definitely enough time in it to learn and to probably get a sense of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I could guess how you're going to answer this, but I really have no idea. So I'm curious to learn, why did you decide to go back to an AE role? I mean, was it pandemic? Was it some of this circumstantial stuff? Or was it like you actually got into the role and you found out some things you didn't like and you made a conscious decision to go back? Wherever you want to go on that topic, I'm very curious to hear. Yeah, I think it's a mix of both, but more of the latter. And so... I'd always wanted to be in a leadership role. I think the best opportunity I had to do that was at Demandbase. I definitely jumped away from Demandbase a little too quickly. I truly believe if I was still at Demandbase, I'd be in a senior leadership role, but I can't change the past. So interesting. Did how you, and got, you chose yeah, to leave there? I chose to leave there. Uh, there were some like things going on. And um, of course, the big OTE and shiny new product that was kind of pitched to me when I was getting recruited you know, caused me to leave there. But I always wanted to get into a leadership role um, in the back of my head. I think it's mm -hmm. really what I wanted to do. I think it was a, an ego thing, to be honest, because I never got for all I, of us. It is. Yeah, I never gotten the opportunity. I was seeing all these people get promoted or people that were that were leaders. And, and uh, I'm a very competitive person. And it's like, you know, I could do that. I think I would be good at it. I've always been a leader without having the title. And so my goal with the other companies that I went to after demand base outreach and lattice, I always wanted to move into a leadership role, but the the opportunities were never given to me. I joined the company too late. People had already been there for longer than me and they were getting the, the opportunities, even though I may have been potentially more qualified. And so there was a opportunity for me externally to move into a leadership role. I was looking at a couple different companies, landed at QA Wolf, 
And I had no idea what I was getting myself into, right? I didn't know what to look for. I Were didn't they a know smaller what... company than where you were coming from? Yeah, Series A just Okay. raised the round. I was the highest level manager for the SDR. So I was running everything, reporting it to a founder. And so I was kind of learning by brute force once I got in there. And so I think the reason I left, again, a mix of both. You know, number one, I found that managing SDRs was incredibly difficult to do for me specifically. And it wasn't something that I was expecting in, in terms of... Can we, I want to back up for just a second, because I, Yeah. I realized I should have started by getting a better sense of that role. So hold that thought. When you went into this role, was there already an SDR team and model figured out? Was your job to grow it? Did you come in and take over the team? Maybe back up there, just give us that Yeah. context. Yeah. So there was a team in place of about eight. There was a manager who had just left the company. Okay. And I was walking into a situation where they had just missed their number like three months in a row. Mm. Email deliverability was really bad. Like their email open rate was in the 20s in terms of like percentile, percentile 20, 20 ish percent email open rate. And my job was to come in and share Exit. and teach the team very tactical prospecting tips and, and build out the playbook from scratch because they didn't really have one. Okay. And so that was kind of the, the situation that I was running into. There was a lot of friction between the, the team and some of the leadership because there, was that, there wasn't that middle ground person to kind of put an umbrella on top of what's coming up from the top all the way to the, to the bottom. So I was, I was walking into a very interesting environment. It's not unusual. Thanks for, for going back to that. I'm glad I asked that. So it's not unusual, right? I think there's a few different scenarios that someone can walk into. And the reason I wanted to go back is to make sure that we don't give sort of a cookie cutter story. And everyone just thinks that like, this is what it will be like if you go into an SDR leadership role, because it's very different, right? You could be in a situation where you get hired in and maybe they have two or three SDRs and they've really cracked the code and they have a great process and a great outbound model. And they really need someone who just can come in and replicate it. Like that's a good scenario basically to walk into, but it's a bit more challenging, if not impossible to walk in when there's a bunch of people, there's a manager who already failed, you know, people are not hitting their quota, they don't have a playbook and they're basically saying, hey, this thing's broken. It's never even worked. We need you to not even fix it, but we need you to make it fixed for the first time, right? It's not even like a, it broke and now you need to fix it. It's like we got all this mess in place and we need you to come figure it out. I would argue that's harder than if you came in and there was no one and you started from scratch, right? And in many cases, that's easier because you figure it out yourself. You're not distracted managing a bunch of people. Then you add one or two people and like you go gradually, gradually. It's a lot harder to come in and fix a broken ship with eight direct reports. Yeah, and that was the hand I was dealt ultimately. And what I found through that process is we did a lot of good work. Like we, we got the email deliverability fixed. We built a bunch of new sequences and email templates, and I was doing a ton of coaching and I was rebuilding the morale on the team because it was a disaster. The That's manager a huge just part. left. Yeah. Manager just left. No one's hitting quota. How do I motivate these people? And the problem was we did all this and we still were struggling to generate meaningful pipeline. There was sales and marketing friction where who's taking the credit for what? And what we learned is that this specific ICP that we were going after, outbound just wasn't a fit. And so that's part of the reason I transitioned is that they it wasn't a fit for BDRs. They had AEs that could be full cycle and they were generating enough marketing sourced pipeline that it just didn't make sense anymore. So I had a conversation with the, the leadership team. They wanted to keep me on as an AE. I decided to take that opportunity to discuss or you know think about what was best for me as a next step. And so that was really the reason I left was it just wasn't working. And ultimately, I didn't really enjoy it because of the hand I was dealt. So I think I got a maybe misinterpreted situation of what it actually could be like being an SDR leader because of the hand I was dealt. So it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And, and that was why I was looking for an AE role as as the next opportunity versus another, you know, SDR leader role. Misinterpreted is a very nice way to put it. You were Right. it sounds like you were sold a dream and uh like many of us, you know, this this does happen in SaaS quite often. And I will say oftentimes it's not their fault, right? Oftentimes the founders just have, don't have a clue what they're talking about and so they just recruit you and they just think like, "Oh, like our last manager just sucked and like we could totally fix this and you're going to be great and like come on in and welcome to the team and welcome to the rocket ship," right? And like Yeah. and then you come in it's like, "Ah, 
oh, there's a lot of shit here that I got to kind of figure out, right? And maybe some of this is not so easy to figure out. And uh, maybe this is going to be a nightmare. And, you know, and every week goes by and it gets a little different, a little different. But I think that makes sense. And I think I would not regret that if I were you. I would imagine you don't. Probably an incredible learning experience. I would also not assume that it would be the same everywhere. But now, you know, like context matters, right? And that's why I wanted to dive into this, not to, to tear you apart or anything, but really for everyone who's listening, because I, I think just about every salesperson I know wants to, in some part of their brain, get into leadership. And I'm constantly telling people, like, I, I've probably seen it not work out more than I've seen it work out. And it's not usually someone's fault. And that's why I think you're a great example because you're clearly a great salesperson. There's no question about that, right? Probably a great sales leader as well. But oftentimes we're put into these positions where the, just the raw materials aren't there. Like maybe the product's just not strong enough to go have full-time outbound people. Like just might not be that compelling, right? That you're going to have a team and you have to get to three to, three to one LTV over CAC. And it's like, well, Maybe we could book some meetings and grow, but can this thing really become profitable with people just pounding the phones all day? Sometimes it just can't, right? So there's yeah. a lot of reasons there, a lot of reasons, but I think you made what looks like on your resume, at least a very smart decision, right? Because you got that experience. Then you decide to go back to an AE role and decide to do it at a bigger, more stable company instead of just taking the, the AE spot that they offered you at QA. I think that as well, very, very smart decision there. Let's jump into the outbound model. What do you think is broken with the outbound model over the last few years? And what do you think needs to change? Yeah, the number one issue is that sequences, you know, the outreaches, sales lofts of the world, I think they, not them themselves, but the, the ability to have sequences and automate things that killed outbound mm. effectively. When you put tools in the hands of people that don't know what they're doing, it just makes the issue worse. Ultimately, you're you're making the issue bigger. So you take a team that doesn't have the right messaging, they don't know how to actually interact with prospects, and you give them a tool that helps them do more of that, well, you're just gonna have more of the bad output out there in, in your market. And so I do think we've lost the art of what outbound actually should look like and what it actually means to do it effectively. And so you still have these companies doing the typical 30-day automated sequence with 14 touches and then they get put in the garbage after three touches and SDRs don't look at them and they don't get a response and so they move on to the next thing and they don't follow up effectively. And I think that's thing number one. Number two is you have still so many SDRs on the, on the team without really knowing if the territory alignment makes sense for that many SDRs. So if you have 20 SDRs and you still are struggling to hit your quota, well, it's either your messaging is off and you're not reaching enough prospects or there's just too many SDRs to have it make sense when your territory isn't big enough and you could probably do more with less. So I think those are the two biggest issues I'm seeing. And it's a huge problem because if you have you know a 30-day sequence going out to thousands of prospects and you ruin your email deliverability and you're not following up with people effectively, you don't have the right messaging, you're just not going to hit your quota. It's, it's, it's pretty black and white to me. And so I think a lot of these tools have ruined outbound for a lot of organizations. Yeah, we've kind of become a victim of our own success in that regard, right? If you can automate something so easily, it's like there's going to just become too much of it. And then that in and of itself starts to cannibalize. I actually think sequences and cadences, I have a theory here. And it's also gotten easier inside of Gmail to just block a sender. Like I notice now when I click like report spam, it'll now often prompt me like, do you want to block them? And it's like giving you that chance now. It's even like suggesting that you do that. And I think I know for myself personally, like I end up clicking yes more often than I used to, or, or at least I can end up blocking people more often than I used to because it's giving me that prompt. And I know in my head, like if I just throw this in spam, I can tell as a sales leader by reading it that this is a cadence. There's going to be 15 more that are to follow. And I'm not interested in the first one. I don't want to have to deal with the 15 more. So now I'm blocking you. And it's like, that's even worse, right? Because that's just going to hit your deliverability. It's going to mess up your domain, all that sort of stuff. So I think I'm, I'm totally with you. We have, we have just abused the crap out of this. It's actually 
an episode that I recorded yesterday with Scott Lee. So he hit on the the, the same the same angle there. So totally yeah. with you. Yeah, and I, I often get asked like, okay, well, what can we do to stand out? You know, what what tools can we be using? What strategies? And I often tell people get back to the fundamentals. Yeah. Right. Like you got to remember when when a prospect opens up their inbox, they're not hoping to see your message. Their inbox is from clients. It's internal messages. They have priorities when they open up that inbox. So you need to be able to stand out with that in mind. You need to be able to leverage other channels. You need to have business acumen. You need to be able to speak their language. You need to go to events. You need to really use all the signals available to you to create a compelling reason why you're reaching out and use your customers as proof points in terms of the problems that your prospects may may have as well. Those are the two best ways that I know to stand out and get back to the fundamentals versus I'm spending 20 minutes on research because I don't know what I'm looking for. And so I abandon the research and I just send a template. That's what people do because there's the catch 22. Do I spend time researching or do I spend time on crafting an email? But I also have to hit my activity numbers that my manager is telling me that I have to hit. And so what's the balance, right? I don't know how to research. I don't know how to write a good email. So I'm just going to send a template because I want to hit my number and I don't want to get yelled at. Yeah, it's so natural too. Like I think the difference with cold calling, you know, I think back to my early days pounding the phones and we didn't do any cold emailing when I started at the, we were selling to restaurant owners. They weren't, they didn't even have email addresses, you know, in, in 2012, most of them, if they did, they weren't checking them. So we were just pounding the phones and it was like, what was nice about that was that you were forced to do it. You couldn't automate it, right? Like you had to pick up the phone and make a hundred dials if you wanted to hit your number. With email, it's different, right? Like you can just blast them out and the speed and the quality is kind of in your control and like you can work a lot less and send a lot more out. And I just think what happens there is when you have such a low success rate on something like cold calls or cold emails, if you can automate it, your your natural inclination is going to be to do it because 90% of the time or whatever, it doesn't work anyway, right? Like the same thing with a cold call, but the cold call was different. We we had to have that discipline. Like we couldn't just push a button and fire off a hundred of our calls, although with parallel dialers and whatnot, there's some aspect of that. But you still had to basically talk, right? A hundred times. You had to give your delivery. And it's kind of hard to like just half-ass that and templatize that. You really can't. Like you're forced to actually do it. So these tools in many ways have caused that problem. And the one thing that I think is sort of happening now is there's a bit of a, I think a decision for teams to make as to like, why are they running their outbound motion? Like what aspect of their sales process are they actually hoping to deliver on there? Are you doing it for awareness? Like, are you just like, hey, no one knows about the problem we solve. No one knows about the product. We just want to get the word out there. So we're going to spend a bunch of money on outbound and you know we'll probably get some demos, but like really we're doing it to spread the word. I think that's actually a much more sound strategy today because that's really what it does is even if people are not replying, you are spreading awareness. And you know, I get messages in LinkedIn all the time. I'm like, ugh, you know, I'm not getting like I have no interest. But sometimes I'm like, but what is that? Like I'm curious. And you click the link and you're like, let me just take a look. It's a new sales tool. Let me look. Maybe I'll I'll be curious. And so there's an awareness factor. And I think outbound is still very, very, very effective at that. Because if you just put something in someone's face, they become aware subconsciously of the brand. And so that's where I think there's a lot of value still in outbound, but where it's getting increasingly difficult is actually delivering meetings on a, on a regular schedule because there's just so much of it, right? Yeah. So much noise. The, the last thing I'll say on this is I think of the SDR orgs that are still doing it really well, like the snowflakes, the talk desks of the world. They have really strong ABM account-based selling motions where they're so tightly aligned with marketing that they're really just capturing demand really at the end of the day. They're not doing true cold outbound. They've never heard of you before. And so I still think the demand creation, demand capture model is working really well for a lot of organizations, but not every organization has that ability to create a ton of demand. Like budgets are getting cut every day and people aren't getting hired as often. So the sales and marketing alignment, if you can nail that, is going to help the efficiency of your SDR team. But if you're just trying to go cold outbound to book meetings without any marketing support or air cover, it's going to be really difficult. So that's where I think people need to get back to the fundamentals that were working in 2015, 2016. You do cold cool campaigns with your marketing org to go after specific target accounts. And I still think that works today, but it's a great way to stand out. Yeah. I mean, it's work. A great example of that today is Rippling, right? They're crushing it with Outbound. And also like you mentioned, Snowflake, TalkDesk, like these are really strong products, 
really strong brands. So yeah, like that awareness piece is already there. Like people know who these companies are, they know what they do, and they're like amongst the best in class, right? So if you have all of those things and what you want is market share and speed to market and speed to growth, it makes so much sense to go all in on this. This actually carries us nicely into the next topic here, which is growth at all cost. So I've been using Rippling as a great example here because what I'm noticing is sort of a divergence in the SaaS market where companies are picking what strategy they want to go. Do they want to raise a ton of money and we want to try and grow as fast as possible and get as much market share as possible? And Rippling's, again, great example of that. They're selling a product that has incredible demand because every company literally needs to pick who they're going to have manage their payroll and their health benefits and that stuff. So like, it's not even do companies have a budget for it? Do they have a need for it? Is there timing for it? Like they have all of those things, check, 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 check. They're going to just go with the best. And no one likes Trinet. People don't really like JustWorks. People complain about about all of the things on the market, benefits, whatever. So if you come out with something newer, cooler, more exciting, and then the CEO is the guy who built the last one, so he knows how to one-up it and make it better, like you can check every box for all the reasons to go growth at all costs, hire a ton of SDRs, bring that thing to market as fast as possible. I mean, heck, I think they're giving away like $150 gift cards for people to take demos with them. Like they're bribing people into it. And not every company can do that. Most companies are going to just burn a bunch of cash doing that. And it's just not worth it. So I want to get your thoughts there because that is the growth at all cost model. We've seen that play out. You know, I've I've played it out at Aircall. I mean, LinkedIn is way beyond that point at, at this point, but I would imagine you got a good taste of that at, at previous companies. So so what are your yeah. thoughts there? Do you have a sense of what's going on with growth at all costs? Take it away. Where do you see that going? Do you think it's disappearing or do you think it's splitting into two different worlds? What do you think? Yeah, I think I saw this at Outreach. So they had a huge SDR team for a really long time and they were doing the growth at all costs, like as many meetings as possible. We don't really care who we're talking to. We just want to get as, as many as at bats as, as we can. Then what they realized is that it wasn't efficient because meetings weren't tur turning into pipeline and they were measuring the wrong things. And then AEs had to start sourcing 30% of their own pipeline. So you had to become more efficient. And what that led to is less SDRs and you didn't have the one-to-one -one pairing anymore. You maybe had one SDR for every two AEs. And then a lot of my own pipeline was just coming for me because of the SDR alignment. So I think there's a reason why growth at all costs doesn't work. I think you could do it up to a certain point and then it just doesn't make sense as you're trying to scale to a specific revenue target, in my opinion. I also had, saw it at Lattice. So Lattice, they SDRs were measured on meeting set, not meeting set move to pipeline. And that was a disaster for AEs because they were mm. setting meetings for AEs that maybe weren't a good fit. They just wanted to have a conversation. They wanted to learn more. And none of those meetings moved to pipeline. Yet on paper, it looked like the SDR team was crushing it. So in my opinion, I've been a new business AE. I've been a customer AE. And I think the most successful companies are great at bringing in quality deals that don't churn and become raving fans over time. And I think we're starting to see bigger orgs eliminate the SDR need in SMB. So SMB AEs are becoming full cycle. And so to me, that's efficiency versus like growth at all costs. You're trying to do more with less. At LinkedIn, I don't have an SDR. I do a lot of my own self-sourcing pipeline. So I think there's still pockets of organizations that are huge that are still looking to be as efficient as possible. But like you said, there's companies that can offer a $150 gift card because they know when they get that meeting, it's going to turn into pipeline. I do see a lot of companies try that strategy and it's a crapshoot because you don't know if the person's actually going to be interested or not. So that's my take on it. I don't think for the, the masses that growth at all costs is a thing that that works today for most. I'm with you. I'm with you. I think there's there's rare exceptions to it, like those ripplings, whatnot. When it's sort of a race to get market share, then it makes sense, right? And when investors get so much money tied up in something, to them, it can make sense to accelerate things by just burning cash because they have so much money invested in the thing that's like, we may as well double down and move this thing quick because if we go too slow, like we can lose momentum and all that sort of stuff. So there's those weird scenarios 
business. But for sure, I'm with you. I think for your average startup, this playbook is just dying. And it's dying because of the things we talked about before, because everyone's doing it. Everyone's got a sales loft or an outreach account. Everyone's hammering the same customers with just all this noise. And it's just too much, right? It's just like, you know, I'm a sales guy. I like to even look at the emails I get to see like which ones are good and which one aren't. But it's just too many. Like I can't even do that anymore, you know? The bar yeah. is low of what, what yeah. good looks like. And that's why I think people have an opportunity to stand out when you get back to basics. Like if you just pick five accounts a day, three to five contacts at each, and you really focus on the quality, people will see your email and be shocked that you took the time to actually write a well-written email or have a conversation with them and actually understand their business that it will be a breath of fresh air because of all the crap that they get. So choose quality over quantity, and that's the way you're going to stand out and actually book meetings. I'm with you. Let's dive into the next topic. I want to get a good look into your mind here on what you think is the most important information or criteria to look at when selecting a new employer. You know, so you're looking around, you're shopping for startups. You've been through it, right? You've, you've been through some good, some bad, probably a mix of both with each, right? There's always a little bit of both. What do you think now? If you're If you were deciding to leave LinkedIn, like what do you look for? Yeah, I think it's different for each person based on where they're at in their career. So I would look at this differently if I was just graduating college versus me in my early 30s established, I have different wants and needs. So I think for me and where I'm at, and then I can touch on what newer folks should look for is I want leadership and culture that is aligned with my values. So I want to be treated like an adult. I want to be trusted that I'm doing the right things with my time. I don't want to be constantly questioned about activity or if I'm having enough conversations because my thought is I'm doing the right things. And until that trust is broken, like that should be a thing that's already predetermined that I'm doing. And so I want to be treated like an adult first and foremost. I want to be paid well for the work that I'm doing. And I want to have opportunities to grow. Like I want to be working with exciting accounts and doing meaningful work. I think those are the big things for me. Obviously at LinkedIn, there's product market fit, but I think a mistake I made in the past was understanding product market fit at the segment level. So if I were to go to a new company and I'm getting pitched on a strategic role, well, I want to understand what is the product market fit for your strategic segment versus SMB, right? Is it a matter of you crush it in SMB and now you're trying to break into this new unproven segment? I want to know those things. I want to know how long the leaders have been there. I want to know why they haven't left. Because in the past, I was in a role where my leadership changed four times in my first nine months of ramping. And that's a disaster for a new rep. So those are some of the things that I would be looking for. I think for a new person out of college, you should not go to a startup where there is no training, no enablement, no playbooks, because you don't know what you don't know. And you need to learn from someone. So I would always recommend, if possible, go to an org where there is a manager in place. You're not the founding SDR, because otherwise you're just going to fail. And I see it time and time again, people constantly changing their LinkedIn, jumping from startup to startup, being fresh out of college when you could have went to a more established company, learned, and then... Once you have the experience, go take that knowledge and start at a, a startup where you can build that playbook yourself. Wow, you hit on some gold there. I agree with everything. So product market fit by segment or by vertical, that's huge. And I don't hear a lot of people say that or even talk about that, but it's very easy to just be like, we have product market fit, right? And we've mastered it. My first company was the perfect example of that. I worked at Single Platform. We were selling a, a restaurant menu, you know, a digital menu button. So you could add your menu to like your Yelp and your Google. And now those menus are all over the place and always says like powered by single platform or whatever. And so the first vertical we sold to was restaurants. And obviously there was great product market fit, but then they challenged me and they said, we want you to figure out how to sell it to landscapers, yoga studios, salons, barber shops, anyone who has a list of products and services that could be fitting in the format of a menu basically. And that was interesting because that was a whole new ball game, right? We had to write a script that was universal to all of these different verticals and we had to test them out. Some of them worked really well. Some of them failed miserably. And yeah, it that was... I was so lucky to get to do that in my first sales role. And it sounds like you got a taste of that early on. So you realize you're smart enough to realize like just because you could sell something to one vertical, it doesn't mean it's going to be able to be sold to others. So that's a smart thing to ask. And I don't even think that, you know, many people would think to ask that in the interview process. 
process is like, hey, you're, so I see you're hiring 20 more salespeople. By any chance, like, is the plan to like try to sell like to a whole new group? Are you doing something all new here? And I'm going to come in and figure this all out? Like, or are we just repeating something you already know works? So those are two very different things. So great point there. Leadership cycling in and out, you mentioned as well. It's a nightmare for the reps. Right. I've been preaching about this from the rooftops, man, because they love to just constantly cycle in new leaders for the next round or whatever. But they often don't think at all about how that feels for the team who just spent six months or 12 months getting used to their leader, building a relationship, all that stuff. And the no training piece, dude, home run. The only reason I succeeded in my first sales job was because it had phenomenal training. And it doesn't need to be some old guy who's been doing it 50 years. Like the guy who taught me sales was a year older than I was at the time. Actually, I think I might've been a year older than him. I don't even remember. We were very close in age. So just to to paint that picture, like you can find a great training program from young people, from scrappy startups, all that stuff. Great point. Definitely ask those questions. Let's dive into quota attainment here. The average they say is about 40%. I think it's probably lower just because if the data says 40, it's not including the people who don't want to contribute their horrible numbers to the data. So I always think that it's worse. So what do you think's going on there? I mean, does it just tie into all the stuff we talked about? Or do you have any specific thoughts there on why that's so low? Is it just the quotas are too high? Like, where does your head go when you hear that? Yeah, a few things. I think if you think of like the traditional SaaS company, they're trying to get to 100 million, 200 million revenue because that looks really good when you're trying to go public and for investors. And I think what a lot of companies did was try to solve that problem by hiring more. And again, getting back to my territory alignment piece, what happened happens is you hire more people, you shrink the existing AE's territory. So at one of the companies I was at, we went from having 120 accounts to 40 accounts and they hired a ton of more people and they split up the team to new business and customer AEs and it just didn't work. And three months later, they were pushing leadership out the door and all the good reps left. And now that company is not doing as well as they once were because of those changes and the red tape they put in place. So that is thing number one. Thing number two is AEs for some reason still don't think they have the time to build pipeline. And so I think a lack of culture around AE pipe gen is miserable. So I interviewed with Trip Actions, I think it's Navon now. And what I loved about them is their AEs were just constantly doing pipeline gen. And for some people, they could be like, whoa, I, it's not something I want to do. But for me, that was a, a green flag because they understood the importance of that. And they were building that culture out. And what I loved about LinkedIn was that I was in control of my own destiny in this role. I didn't have an SDR. I was responsible for my pipeline. And so I think when AEs aren't doing pipeline gen or they don't know how and are forced to use a tool like outreach and they don't even know what to do and they're just putting people in a spam cannon and, and blasting out emails, you're not going to get enough meetings. You're relying on an SDR who may have other AEs that they're supporting and you just don't have, have enough pipeline. That's number two. And number three is, do people actually care about what you're selling, the product market fit. Companies may be trying to go up market to drive new revenue, or they may mm -hmm. try to expand into new verticals. If you don't have product market fit in that new vertical or a new segment that you're trying to break into, it's gonna be really hard to hit your quota. And so I think it's hard to take a group of 10 AEs and tell them to break into a new vertical and here's a, a brand new quota without anything being proven out. And especially for external hires, you need to be asking those questions about percentage of the team that's hitting quota and looking out for those things. So I think those are the three big things to me that all kind of convolved into one big issue. It's a good list. And even for folks who, so I never worked with territories. I've always done lead assignments, not based on an actual territory, usually based on something, some other criteria, but I will tell you it's the same. Like it's, it has the same impact even. So if you're dividing your leads up for those who are listening, if you're like, well, we don't do territories, we just have lead assignments and you know, it's based on whatever criteria it has the same impact. When you start adding a bunch of outbound folks to the team, there's still only so many leads to go after, right? And I will say too, like with territories, there's an element of it that's probably a bit easier because you can clearly define who gets what lead and stuff. But when you're doing it the way I've done it in the past, which would be more based on maybe account size or maybe it was random. Maybe we just literally took the database in our CRM and just divided it up, right? So people knew what they owned. But there's always this diminishing return effect of just adding more people. It's just they're ultimately going after the same bucket, right? There's
there's a total addressable market and it's just ultimately more noise getting thrown in there. And I would argue a lot of companies make big mistakes here. And maybe this ties into some of the experience you had, but they tend to not have the operations figured out. And it's pretty easy if you have like five reps or whatever, three to five reps, maybe even up to 10, you don't need a bunch of operations to manage territories. It's kind of easy to do somewhat manually. And if the guy next to you is, you know, on your lead, like you notice it and you work it out. But when you have like 50 reps or a hundred reps, that becomes really difficult. And you actually need a really good CRM, well-programmed with lead assignment rules and all that stuff. And oftentimes that stuff's just not even set up right. And that alone could be the reason that SDRs are just wasting their time and could contribute to misquota and, and things like that. Anything else you want to add there? I think one final thought is the fact that people hire more AEs without looking at current capacity of the existing AEs is a huge issue. So until your AEs can't handle more meetings, you probably shouldn't hire anyone else. Bingo. That's Bingo. that's all I got. Because I, you know, people I've worked with in the past, they've gotten burned by that. And it just doesn't make it doesn't, it's not a win for the external hire. It's not a win for the existing team. And you read these glass door, these rep view reviews of like, why are they hiring more people when I can't even hit my quota because I don't have enough accounts to work? Yeah, at some point you gotta take accountability for your quota, but there are external things that sometimes you can't control as a rep, like hiring more people when the current team is struggling to have enough conversations. Yeah, I could tell you why that happens, at least on the executive side, because I preach this all the time. I say scale demand before headcount, right? And so the reason you see it, to give you an answer to that, is often what's happening is the company's trying to raise the next round of funding. They're presenting to their board of investors and to new investors, and they have to show their plan for growth. And they often don't have any other way of showing growth other than by saying, we're going to hire these people and they're going to create this pipeline and they're going to convert more deals. And they have this illusion or delusion in their spreadsheet that basically paints a picture of like, as we add people, we're adding revenue. And it's just not true in most cases. Now, if you have an extremely repeatable outbound process and it's very scalable and you can truly prove that by adding headcount, you can add pipeline. Well, then in some cases, like it actually makes sense. And my first sales job was definitely like that. All right. This is a unique question. I haven't asked this to anyone yet. You've got a good career. You've been at a bunch of companies now. So I'm curious to get your overall perception here of the industry, but it's probably different at each company, I would imagine. But generally speaking, throughout your sales career, do you feel like you've received enough training at the companies you work for? Or do you feel like you mostly have to source that on your own? You have to kind of go out and find it. What's your take there? Yeah, I think every company that I've been at, besides when I was an SDR leader, they invested in some type of training. So whether it be like Skip Miller's training at Outreach or Command of the Message at Lattice and at Outreach or some solution selling that we're doing at LinkedIn, I think everyone's trying to invest in sales training. I think, however, they do so without understanding what the reps actually need. It's a bunch of enablement mm. people who maybe haven't sold before or leaders that aren't in touch with what's going on with the front lines to see if what they're planning to roll out will actually move the needle. I do think there's parts of things I've learned from those trainings that have been impactful, but in my opinion, that time could be better spent in the weeds of my deals and getting coached on mistakes that I've made. Those have always been the most impactful learnings for me is the coaching sessions where hey, I lost this deal. Let's go through and understand why. Because at the end of the day, I can learn how to ask a better discovery question or a better layered question. But I want to understand the themes of the deals and why I'm losing them and then not make those mistakes again. That's what the best reps do in terms of a learning perspective and a skill development is learning from past mistakes. If I got burned by someone that I thought was a champion and they weren't actually a champion, well, now next time I need to learn how to actually test them better, right? So learning from those actual mistakes, you don't learn those that those tactical things often in three day long trainings, right? It's often like, hey, here's the talk track or the messaging and reps often throw it out the window and go back to what they were doing previously after a week or two. So that's kind of my take. I definitely received the training, but I don't think that those trainings were the most impactful lessons that I've learned that really moved the needle for me. I think it's the it's when the managers got in the mud with me and said, hey, let's dissect this deal and understand the themes and let's make sure we apply that to the next deal or the current deals that we're working. Those have been the most impactful to me. I can always learn how to ask a better discovery question, but I always think about what's really going to move the needle for me. And mm. you know, that's how I learn best. You hit the nail on the head. That I mean, that's gold right there. So I've said often that coaching is more important than training. Training is like a new hire onboarding thing, right? It's like, let me teach you the ways that we do things. Let me show you how our tools work. Let me show you our screen 
script and how we talk about certain products. Maybe we have some scripted talking points for like, here's how we describe our product. Here's how we open our cold call elevator pitch. Here's how we talk about the history of the company. That's training and it should be foundational and everyone should get a boatload of that when they you know enter a new org. But to your point, coaching is what really makes the difference. And I noticed this pretty quickly after having ran my first team and hiring some external trainers and experimenting with that, saying like, all right, you know, this is a super well-known sales trainer. Let me bring them in. Maybe they'll bring some energy to the team. Maybe we'll learn some new tips and tricks and maybe we'll see improvement in our performance. And, you know, I could teach trainings and I taught plenty of them. It's what I did for my whole first sales leadership role. But sometimes bringing someone in external, like maybe they're going to bring something I don't have. And so I experimented a bunch with that. And I will tell you that you're right. Like what it does is it'll bring some morale boost. It'll be fun. And you know if it's good and like they're energetic and stuff and people have fun with it. And there's upside to that. That can be worth doing it once in a while. But does it really impact performance? In fact, I would say it declines performance because you took a day off the phones, right? To your point, like you'd rather spend that time on the coaching. And so what I actually noticed after doing those is like, shit, we just lost a day of prospecting. That was the outcome of that training is that we just got off the phones for a day. So what I eventually started doing when I got to air call is I realized that the best way to do training is exactly what you described. It's coaching. And so we obviously would do our one-on-ones and our coaching and go through calls, but then I would bring the group together usually once a week. Maybe we would cancel it if people were busy, but the idea was that we would do coaching as a group. And so everyone would come to the table with the biggest problem that they had that week, whether it's an objection or churn or whatever the situation. Situation, and we would literally role play it and they would tell you like, here's the problem. Here's what they said. We'll play the call. And then we got the whole team sitting around the room to see who feels like they know what they would say or do in that situation. And we would kind of go through it, debate what's the best way. And sort of at the end of each of those conversations, everyone just learned a new scenario. And we all basically came to a consensus of what's the best way to respond to it. And if you walk out of those meetings once a week, you're learning because next week you're in the same situation and you remember back and it's very situational and you got some useful info. So I think you hit the nail on the head there because it's just, there's only so much cookie cutter sales training and you kind of get that out of the way when you're first learning the basics. And then it's like, I really need to know how to answer this very specific nuance question or situation or objection. And no external sales trainer is going to know that. Oftentimes it comes from product expertise. Would you agree with that? Do you find that a lot of the coaching is actually like you're just getting better at the product? Yeah, I think so. And I use the analogy, it's like, it feels really good to buy a new self-help book because it's like the dopamine hit of like, man, I, I accomplished something. I invested in myself. And then the book sits yeah. on the shelf or yeah. you read a few pages. At some point, you got to put foot to pavement and take yeah. action on the thing. And so, yeah, to your point, a lot of it's around product, but ultimately what it comes down to is what's the thing that I can learn from this situation? And then I got to go do the thing enough times to retrain my brain of this is how I should approach it. So stop buying books and leave them on the shelf and just like go and practice what you've learned. That's the best way that I know how to learn. I'm never going to re- learn from just like reading a textbook or reading an article unless yeah. I go apply it right. actually in, in my deals. Right, right. So well said. I, I've got a whole bookshelf over uh, to the side here. Me too. No, right I don't think I've read them all. Like I, I've Same. I've read excerpts of them. You open them, you get into it. Uh, yeah, it's it's a lot. Of, it's fun. It hypes you up. You do it when you yeah. first get into sales and, and, and there's some fun there. And maybe you'll take one good nugget away from like each book. That's usually what the takeaway is. But it's like, I just spent a lot of time reading that thing, right? Like, is that really worth that one nugget? Like probably I could have made a hundred more dials and learned some more, right? Yeah. Or listen to some other people's calls and stuff. So, so I'm with you on that. Let's get your thoughts on AI. Some people are very heated up on this topic. So I'm curious to hear what you think. And I'm talking specifically for outbound right now. I mean, I think the AIAE is like a whole separate conversation. I don't even think it makes sense to have that yet. But what do you think about AI for outbound? Taking into consideration all the things we said above, do you think that for those who want to continue having this aggressive outbound motion, they're just going to automate it with AI? Or do you think that the human SDR sort of still has a future? What are your thoughts there? And what role do you think AI will play over the next five to 10 years in outbound sales? Yeah. Whenever I argue against this, people are always like, well, no one thought that the cell phone would be a thing. And unfortunately, I was too young to see that evolution. It was kind of just already, Mm -hmm. technology was already ingrained. So 
You had an iPhone your whole life. No, I had the walkie-talkie phone and like uh, the no, the Nextels. Yeah, the Nextels, and and when I was yeah, my older sister had one, and then the Sidekick and the Envy. But I was too young to really understand the evolution. Now looking back, I can understand. But what I will say is, going back to my my initial point is, if you just transition to this world of AI SDRs, it's just like any other trend or strategy. Prospects are going to then build up a spam filter and understanding that, hey, this is probably AI or this is a sequence. I'm not going to respond. It's hard for me to see a future where there is an AI SDR making dials or sending out LinkedIn messages or emails that are more effective than a human going to events or using their network or doing outbound effectively and having business acumen. It's hard for me to buy into that on where we stand now. I think it's only going to make it worse like sequences did, in my opinion. That's how I see it. However, I do think like AI co-pilots and agents and assistants that can act as my brain so I don't have to think as much will be super effective. So if I'm trying to think about how I'm going to de-risk this deal, I just want AI to help me with that. Or what are the top talking points for this customer based on previous conversations we've had. Like that's how I think AI is going to help. Not so much of AI helping me book more meetings because it can do it for me. That's how I see it. Yeah. So I've, my views on this have evolved a bit after, because I've had this conversation with everyone I've had on the podcast so far this year and including the CEO of AI SDR. And what's interesting is like, he was actually the one that brought this into my mind first is he said, there's going to be like an AI buying tool. And that's what got me thinking. And the more I think about this and just try to play out where this ends up, what you just said is totally true. We ruined out with templates and and the cadences, right? We made it too easy, too much volume. And so if we're going to only just make that easier, it's going to be the same problem. But it doesn't mean that they're not going to figure it out in certain scenarios. Like they will in the meantime, before it becomes problematic, they will figure it out, they will perfect it. And what that tells me is AI is capable of becoming an effective salesperson. Can it scale and can it last forever? And will people tolerate it? That's like a separate question. And I agree with you. It probably will just reach a breaking point where people just want to block it because it's too much. And that's why I actually think the future is probably more on the AI buyer side, which means that maybe the whole concept of even trying to sell something outbound is going to almost become obsolete. And I don't want to say it will disappear because it won't. There will always be people trying to push something down your throat, something new, something you haven't heard of, whatever. One could argue that's also marketing and like, where do you draw the line between the two and really just brand awareness and all that stuff. But I think the future is really going to be much about AI buying, which means if I have a problem, I'm going to AI to figure out how to solve it. And we're already doing this. We started using search engines. Now we use chat GPT. I've used this example now three episodes in a row, but my niece, I asked her last Christmas, like, do you know what Christmas means and what it stands for? And she ended up giving me this crazy detailed response. And it was because she was talking to her Snapchat AI bot who was teaching her the answer. And so what that told me is the next generation, when they have a question, they already are turning to AI, which means that when they become professionals and they need to buy something and they need to know, should I get HubSpot, Pipedrive or Salesforce or Zoho, their inclination is not going to be to go call a human being and ask them that question because that's not what they do today as a kid. Right. So they're going to go to an AI. And so I think the AI buying tool will become a thing. Will it just be ChatGPT? Maybe for some people, will there be like a special tool that is like, hey, we're the unbiased chat AI of SaaS buying. Like there'll probably be sp- some specific ones that cover certain topics. But I think that's a lot of what we're going to see. And then we're going to need to basically figure out how do we get ourselves to rank high in the recommendations of these chat bots. And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of stuff. And that's why there's a lot of interest in who's going to own chat GPT. And people want to have equity in that because the same way that you used to write blogs to basically get yourself to show up in the search engine results, when someone's looking for a CRM or whatever you're selling, I think it's going to be the same thing. How do we get our product? How do we get ChatGPT to know about it? So when I go in there and say, hey, I need a sales CRM. Here's my situation. I want to make sure that my startup's showing up in there. And so I think there's going to be a whole wave of just trying to figure out how to, like a new level of SEO, so to speak, but for- the AI side of things. Yeah, and I think that's happening on like the recruiting side. If you just go on LinkedIn, there's more AI than ever to help you Mm. find the right role. And I also think that's why working for a more established company with a big brand is beneficial 
for the long run, because if I need to understand different ways to do things, well, the big brands are going to catch my eye first. And then maybe there's, you, you go to chat GPT to find some like other more niche products. Like everyone knows LinkedIn, everyone knows Salesforce, everyone knows HubSpot, everyone knows these bigger companies. So I think those companies are going to have an advantage over smaller startups over long haul and how buyers perceive the market and what tools they should be using. So that's also another reason why I want to join LinkedIn. I think working for a big brand is going to have its advantages and it makes booking meetings a lot easier than if I were working at a brand new LinkedIn competitor that no one's ever heard of. So I think there's pros and cons always, but definitely in a world of AI where to your point, people are going to be using more referral based information mm-hmm. to find products, more chat GPT stuff, working at a more established company is only going to help with that. That ties perfectly into our last question, which is I want to get a sense of what you're doing at LinkedIn. I think a first sort of prerequisite to this is which product are you actually selling? But the real question is what tactics or strategies are you suggesting that's working for you over there? And then there's sort of a second part to that question is really around, well, let me break it into two parts, right? Because I don't want to get too confusing here. So I want to ask what strategies and tactics are working for you in your current role. But then I also want to ask in regards to salespeople using LinkedIn as a tool, people who don't work at LinkedIn, but I'm a salesperson, I'm using Navigator, et cetera. I want to get your best tips and tricks in that regard as well. So if you want to break that into two pieces, you can. If it's the same thing, you can just bucket it together. Yeah, for sure. So I I work on the marketing solutions team. Team, so the advertising side of the house. So you sell to I, who? I sell to the CMOs, VPs of marketing. So you're like not selling brands. the recruitment stuff. That's like a no. separate. I, I have a mix of like early stage tech companies. And then I work with like Pepsi. So like Pepsi's got so many brands that I can break into that maybe aren't spending on LinkedIn. So my job is to multi-thread engage like you would like enterprise selling. And then also ensure that companies that are spending on LinkedIn, I'm growing them. They're not churning all of that. So my job when I'm I'm thinking about pipeline is getting conversations started with accounts we've never spoken to, breaking into new brands or new business units across my big accounts. So what I'm doing is I'm using Sales Navigator and this is literally my strategy. I will literally on my notebook write down five accounts per day that I want to target or five new business units and then I'll find three to five contacts. I'll develop a point of view. Sometimes it takes me five minutes. Sometimes I need to search through a 10K, but I want to have a really relevant point of view of why I'm reaching out specifically to them. So that's where it goes back to like making sure you're taking your time, spending it on quality versus quantity. Then I understand what's the problem that I potentially help them solve with that observation. So is there something going wrong in their existing campaigns or do they have a new initiative from their 10K? And then I'm tying it back to how we can help. That's really what my strategy is. And I I leverage that message messaging matrix across email and LinkedIn primarily. That's where my prospects respond the most. They don't pick up the phone, so I don't use it as much. And so I think I'm a big proponent of using the data to tell you what to execute on. If your prospects aren't picking up the phone, look at the channels that they're, they are active on. So for me, it's email and LinkedIn. And you're I'll going full there. cycle, yeah? Yeah, full cycle. So you're bringing, them, you're bringing in the pipeline. Are you reaching out to existing customers as well? I think I heard you say that, right? So it's, it's a bit of growing accounts as well as bringing in new accounts? That's right. It's new business along with companies that may be spending but never spoken to us. And my job is to understand, like, can I take them from spending 5K a month to 20K a month? Because that's like a high impact growth opportunity for us. Or if like Gatorade or Doritos has never spent on LinkedIn, what can I do to engage those brands to get them to activate on LinkedIn for the first time? Which is challenging because LinkedIn's a B2B platform more or less, and they're used to spending their dollars on where they can reach consumers more often. So Mm -hmm. it's a uh, interesting way to go about things and presents an interesting opportunity for me. So that's on my strategy on what's kind of working for me. I'll also leverage marketing to like drive them to events and get in person, something I'm Really trying to do is get in person with my customers more often this year. Mm. Do you have, I don't know if you're allowed to answer this publicly, if you can't, it's fine, but do they split your quota? Is like part of the quota for upsell and growing accounts and then part of it's for new business or do you just have a revenue growth goal and you can get it however? Yeah, I just have one number. Um, oh, cool, that's nice. Across, yeah, across my accounts. So you for could in the, theory hit your quota yeah. by just growing all existing accounts. Yes. And you could keep your job and they'd be happy and that's all good. Yes. For me though, like if I'm thinking about Pepsi, they have bigger budgets than a startup. So I want to go after Pepsi and break into those new brands. So 
there's a lot of creativity that goes into how I can reach my number more or less. Well, I like that process. So you're looking for five accounts a day, then three to five contacts at each. And then you're looking for your point of view on, on basically how you want to approach the situation. It's simple, right? And you just repeat that motion every day? Yeah, more or less. And I build out calendar blocks in the calendar each day for the next day. So I look at the white space and then I will put like specific activities versus like, this is going to be a prospecting block. Because for me, when I see prospecting block, that me can mean a million things. And my brain, I need specific tasks. Otherwise, I'm not going to know what to do at that time. So if I need to send five emails, I'm putting send five emails over the next 30 minutes or whatever the block is. And I think just shifting to the next question about what I also see working across other teams if I were in a different role is I think you need to be A-B testing everything. So what I would recommend is you're trying a new tactic, whether I'm sharing it with you or you're reading it on LinkedIn, do 50 prospects on that specific tactic and see what the data tells you. Like, were you able to get any meetings? Were you not? And then shift from there. I think Sales Navigator's ability to show you past customers who's posted on LinkedIn, who's active on LinkedIn and then leveraging that, I think is a huge plus right now. I think the best way to get meetings is through warm intros and through your network. So anything you could do there. And then I think tactically, I'm a fan of the sequence approach. So I still use sequences, just not the traditional 28 day automated. I use like a kind of a cluster. So on the first day I'll do a, like if I were just selling traditional SaaS, SDR, AE, I would do a phone call, a LinkedIn view, and then an email. And then I'm basically using that engagement and what I get from that to figure out what my next move is. So and you do that all it, in one day, hit them all three spots. On yeah, the same because day. Ch- chances are they're not going to answer, you know, if they don't answer the phone call, I want to just check out their LinkedIn. So they see that I viewed their profile. Maybe they check out who I am. Then I send them a very relevant, personalized email to them specifically. Um, so you're not browsing that, private on LinkedIn. I think that's a very yes, important I'm detail not. to point out to people. You are using the fact that they're going to see that you looked at their profile. I'm trying to build awareness yep. of who I am, what the problem is I solve with my email. And then if they open my email three or more times, that's going to change my cold call opener on day three if they answer the phone. It's also going to change how I connect with them on LinkedIn. Because if they see my email, I'll just say something like, hey, I sent you an email the other day, just wanted to put a face to the name. I know they've seen my email. And so they're going to be more likely to accept my connection request. Then I can start a conversation with them in the LinkedIn DMs or send them a voice note. Or if they answer my call, I could say, hey, this is Anthony with LinkedIn. Does that ring a bell if they've opened my email? So I'm using the prospects engagement with my previous day's tactics to dictate my next move ultimately. That makes a lot of sense. So it's not your typical cadence. I mean, you're using the tool to help you stay organized, but really it's what happens determines what you do next. Love it. One last thing I want to throw in here, besides Navigator, what's super critical in your tech stack? Are you using Clay? Are you using any of these new things? Yeah, I use Perplexity quite often because it's very good at giving me quick 10K information and how we specifically can help with those initiatives. I use video prospecting. So there's a million tools out there for video prospecting. Prospecting. And then we use sales loft, but honestly, I send a lot of my emails out of Outlook because they're pretty manual and I'm just doing things. Oh, that's right. By... They got you guys on Outlook, huh? Yeah, we're using Outlook. But yeah, I'm kind of like the quarterback instead of letting the sequence or cadence determine what I do next. I use the sequence to organize my touches and then I dictate what happens next ultimately. So those are the big three for me. Clay, not as relevant just because I have all the data, but I've heard great things about it. There's another really cool tool called Tome, T-O-M-E basically takes your seller profile, the problems you solve, past conversations you've had, like it plugs into Gong, and it'll basically give someone a full picture of what you've talked about in the past, what's going on with their initiatives, who are the people you need to reach out to. That's another cool- Oh, so it's summarizing like all the calls? All the calls. All the first party data, all the Salesforce data, all the marketing data, and then all the external stuff. So it gives you like a full picture of, hey, why didn't they go with us in the past? What was like the reason? And what can I say to them next? Or what were the objections previously? I thought that was like really cool. If that's accurate, that that sounds super useful, especially on the leadership side. That's great. I mean, God, I would have loved to have something like that because a huge time suck as a VP sales or sales managers, like people come up to you for help. And it's like, hold on, do you got to tell me everything about the account now? Right? Like, yeah. And, and, 
and all the history and all that stuff. So that sounds super useful. Awesome, man. Any last little nuggets you want to throw in there? I think we got through all nine questions. So thank you. No, I think if there's any salespeople listening, just we didn't talk about this, but like make sure that you're doing stuff outside of work that makes you feel good, that fills up your cup because work at the end of the day is just work and you Mm. perform better at work when you're feeling good outside of work. So that's my parting message with everyone. Yeah, I was one who didn't really get too much into the party scene in my first sales job, but it's because I was a bit older than everyone else on my team. But I will say, and I don't say this to pat myself on the back. It was just, I was a different age. So like it worked out in my favor, but that had a lot to do with me being able to succeed a bit faster than some other people. It's just like, I was focused on the job. It doesn't mean don't have fun. Like, but if you're going out drinking every night and I hear what you're saying, like have fun outside of work and stuff, but I'm also emphasizing like that doesn't mean go get shit faced every night too. Right. Cause that's going to just have the opposite effect on your work. And if you get too involved in the social scene, it makes it harder to move up too, just because you become one of the group instead of a potential leader. So something also to consider, but for sure, you got to have a life outside of work. It's got to be fun. It's got to make it all worth it. Cause at the end of the day, you know, I don't think we get into sales because we love selling. People love to say that. And I think it's total bullshit. I think we love the money. We love the adrenaline. We love being in control of our own destiny, but anyone who truly likes waking up and loves doing this every day, I just say to you, send me your paycheck because you love it enough that you should just do it for the reward, (laughs) but no one will ever do that. Right. So you're right. You got to have real passion in life and have a game plan long-term and make sure that all the hard work that you're doing is contributing to filling that puzzle out, whether it's buying a house someday or saving for a wedding or what have you. So awesome. Anthony, uh, we we could talk all day. Um, I love it. We got a lot of good stuff in here. We'll have to do it again sometime. Where should everyone follow you on X on LinkedIn? Are you elsewhere? That's it. Just if you need anything, DM me. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can, but appreciate the time today and looking forward to staying in touch. Likewise, man. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you.